Mariana Nunn, the director of the uh, Art Museum and the Visual Arts Program at the National Hispanic Cultural Center, right down the street. And um, I'm really pleased to be here. Um, I was really both scared and excited when Amy asked me to speak, um, and I'll tell you why in a second. Because I'm a well, because I'm a visual person and not a language person, um, and also to be here with Gabriella and my colleagues here at Working Class and because the work they do is so important. And a lot, and a lot is similar to what we do at the Hispanic Cultural Center. Um, I this is a, a this is I just picked a breakfast slide because it was early in the morning. I'm not a morning person. Um, this is called Breakfast with JC um, by Maria Romero Cash. <laughs> and um, as I said, when Amy Amy said, you, you know, would you be willing to talk about language? Um, I did panic because I am a visual person. I need pictures. That's why I was joking over there when we couldn't get the when we couldn't get the um, projector working. I'm like, I don't think I can do it without pictures. I'm an art history person. Um, I um, I laugh because my my mother is a literary critic. So she deals with language. My father is a historian. He deals with language. My step parents um, uh, are both uh, university professors. And um, I went into retail. <laughs> I had a long career in retail at the Gap in the Banana Republic, Macy's, and that was my rebellion against um, uh, against uh, they call it my rebellion. But they were all really good shoppers and they trained me well. Um, <laughs> So, seriously, I was like, I can think of so many other people who would be able to talk about language. But then I started thinking about my work and what language, how I use language in my work. And, you know, my passion has been, and I'll talk a little bit about this with some of the other slides, my passion has been um, looking at how Latino and Hispanic artists, Chicano artists, the Latin American artists, are treated, how they are referenced, how they are um, uh, selected for museum exhibits, how they are described by art critics. And so as I look at that and look at some of my past research and my current research, um, language is so powerful in this because it sets up perceptions, it excludes, um, it inserts, and it's one of the reasons why I think, in, in my opinion, that Latino and Hispanic artists are still not being given their due. Um, and so, um, a little bit about how this started for me in my dissertation research at UNM was my uh, research on the WPA artists of New Mexico, um, the Hispanic WPA artists of New Mexico. And I would go around and talk to people and say, well, I'm doing work on, on the Hispanic artists during the 1930s and 1940s. Do you, know, do you have any thoughts? Oh, do you mean Diego Rivera and Orozco and Siqueiros? And I was like, no, I'm actually talking about the New Mexican artists. And they said, well, you know, you're not going to find anything. So I did finally find things. And I found them not under the, the label of artists or art as the Anglo artists were um, included, I found them under handicrafts. And I, um, this, this was even the muralists and, and the painters, um, the fine arts trained artists that we had in our state were under handicrafts. As soon as I f figured that out, all of this, all of this uh, history and knowledge and images emerged and we were able to tell a story of all these forgotten artists. And the project is called Sin Nombre because they were without name. So that really got me to, there's, there's the, the label, right down the street, we're right down the street. And it also falls into my other work, which is about stereotypes. I, I work a lot with stereotypes, research a lot, especially this image of the sleeping Mexican, and what that, what that does, and that's a whole other talk. But this is an early slide, a 1901 um, image of New Mexico begging for statehood. So the perception is that this is a little Mexican girl uh, um, begging, begging the beautiful liberty of the United States for statehood. Um, it's a stereotype I think we still deal with here. Here's our state seal. Have you ever really noticed this before? 
It was one of the, I don't know if you know who the De La Cota brothers are, these great artists, bi binational artists, um, Me Mexico and the U.S. And they were here, we did a great exhibit with them, and they um, pointed this out, and they're like, Tay, and I had never noticed this before, but this is the state seal. It's the American eagle protecting the Mexican eagle. So, going back, this is just setting up the perception of Hispanics in Mexico and New Mexico. Going back to my research on the WPA, this piece, which is a masterpiece by Jose Dolores Lopez, a Cordova artist, this picture, when I found it, was captioned, Religious Statue Made by Indian. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't know it was shown at the Corcoran Gallery of Art. This is the artist. Corcoran Gallery of Art in the 1930s. And they didn't know what to do with it, so, so they put it with Maria Martinez's pottery and everything in a side room. Um, but that's how artists were being treated, and it was the Anglo administrators who were making the decisions. I don't know if you've seen the Gorilla Girls um, interview with Stephen Colbert recently. I posted it on my Facebook yesterday. It's the most eloquent uh, you know, the Gorilla Girls run, Stephen Colbert. Does everybody know who the Gorilla Girls are? Um, there was the most eloquent thing that one of the gorillas, Guerrera, said, um, every, aesthetic decision, every aesthetic decision made in the art world is important. Every aesthetic decision, every label, every, every word used in the art world is important. Some of the words that are used to describe the artists, and still are, crude, Naive, rustic, quaint, um, simple. Um, and so I'm talking, I, I, I'm using those words in, in the research that I did in the, the New Mexican artists, but these are words that are used to describe Latino artists and Latin American artists as well. Those who do painting, murals, uh, mixed media, um, these are the descriptors that are used still. When I was at the um, Folk Art Museum, I was a curator there for about 10 years, I would go through the, um, the words to my docents that they were not allowed to use in the galleries. And I would make long lists. You cannot use quaint, you cannot use crude, you cannot use rustic. And still, the docents, even after training, would describe the work in those terms. Very frustrating. Mm -hmm. One of the other artists, yeah, that's perfect. One of the other artists um, who has been described this way is really a rock star. Um, this is the work of Patrocinio Varela. This is the artist, and he was the first Taos artist of any ethnicity to be shown at the Museum of Modern Art. A, 19, a very pivotal 1936 show called New Horizons of American Art. Seven of his pieces were selected for that exhibit. The, and he was a WPA artist. Um, he was Times, uh, Time Magazine's Man of the Year that year. He was described as a, a true primitive and a naive genius. <laughs> now remember, I know, I'm looking back, it's the 30s, that was probably the height of modernism. You could, you could, you know, it, it was probably a very high compliment, <laughs> but it makes you cringe today, right? And it was set up that way. Um, his, the administrators, the Anglo administrators of the WPA protected him. There were lots of art dealers who wanted to represent his work. And um, they, they said he wouldn't be able to handle it. He, he, you know, he lived in a mountain town, little mountain town, came down once a year. I mean, they made, you should see how it's described in, in um, the uh, memos. This is a Russell Lee photograph um, taken in Costilla in 1939, I think. And this is always something that I use uh, to illustrate my topic. And it, many of you do know who Russell Lee is, a very famous photographer, who worked for the Farm Security Administration. Let me read you the label of this photo. Um, ingredients for dyeing wool used at a Works Progress Administration weaving project. They are indigo, 
nitric acid, powdered alum, bark, burdock root, cochineal, and walnut husks. Isn't that a dramatic reading of ingredients? <laughs> Here's the weavers of that project. This is what that photo says. Spanish American girls at weaving project. They're not identified. They are, we have identified them since. Um, so from left to right is Beatriz Valdez, Belisandro de Herrera, and Ramoncita Quintana. But that's how, that's how the artists were treated. Again, language is very powerful. How about this one? <laughs> Cracks me up. Um, you know, uh, we're, we're going to start. We're going to talk about labels in a second. But can you imagine? Um, she's she's dabbling with an apron on, by the way. Mm -hmm. Might add, um, this perception of Latino and Latin American artists really does continue today. Um, there's a great show of Carmelo Mascarza's work um, at the Hirshhorn Museum in 1994, I think. Um, she's a Texas artist, fine arts trained. Um, and she, uh, we have a, we have a piece actually hanging in our, in, in the gallery right now, but she, she creates, um, scenes of everyday life in Texas. It was a one person show at the Hirshhorn for a Tejana artist and the Washington Post arts critic absolutely railed on it and called it simple and naive. This is in 94. So my, you know, my point is that these descriptors of the 30s are, are still continuing today, and it's very, um, it's very uh, non-inclusive in the art world um, by just using these powerful words and reducing people of color, artists of color, to doing simple and naive things because they have culture, right? So. Um, and then this year, last year, there was another Latino art show at the Amer uh, National Museum of American Art, curated by my colleague Evelyn Car Carmen Ramos. And again, the Washington Post art critic did not did not get it, and he just railed against la uh, Latino artists. Um, so I always tell all my interns and students, go be an art critic. Don't be a museum curator. Go be an art critic, so that we have people truly talking about what's going on. But again, this is, you know, this is in the 30s or the 40s. There's Frida Kahlo painting a portrait, which is an elevated, you know, an elevated form in the art world. And she's gleefully dabbling. You know, language is really important in this, but also is the, the, the perceptions of media, what artists are using, um, why fine arts trained artists can be described with certain words, and how artists working in, in traditional forms. Um, can be described with certain words and what those words mean. And sometimes the artists take it on themselves. This is um, another just favorite throwing it in. Uh, Paula Lopez, um, who is dealing against, is, is ta tackling and, and, and um, going on uh, directly about saying, I am not a hood ornament. Um, and she's got all these stereotypes of, of Latino women. And one of my favorites. At least he's not sleeping against the cat. Right? Um, as if anybody would do that. <laughs> uh, I just can't, can't, can't get over that. But this has been a long, um, somewhere there's a book in the making, but this has been a long term project of mine. Uh, but the image of the sleeping Mexican, so you may be going, why this tale, does this have to do with language? The image of the sleeping Mexican affects how we look at Latino and Hispanic artists, it affects how we look at Latino and Hispanic culture. But it is so pervasive still, even though it was something that developed in the first half of the 20th century, that just this image, um, you know, makes makes people think diminutively, um, folklorically, um, and those types of in those types of thoughts on on um, Latin American artists, Latino artists. One of our favorites, Gabriela's and mine. Um, you may notice the mural outside is something that Eric Garcia worked on. But here's um, Eric Garcia, who is from Albuquerque and lives in, Cal in uh, Chicago now. But this is a piece actually that we're actually getting at the museum, um, and it's called and it's his redux of the 
of the sleeping Mexican, right? And it's called the sleeping giant, which often Mexico is referred to in those words. And here he's reading, he's, re he's reading, and here's philosophy, history, revolution, <coughs> economics, and science. And Lady Liberty <laughs> and Uncle Sam are running by going, shh, be quiet. If this guy gets up, we're in, we've got a problem. <laughs> in those last couple of slides that we just saw with Pola, uh, Lope, uh, Lopez um, titling her piece on how to put on it, and Eric redoing, putting the language in the image to help explain it. Um, the other part of my work, is, which is really important, um, is when we do labels in the museum. Um, the, the word choice in our labels counteracts all of what has happened before. So we actually name the people. We work to identify the weavers in Costilla. And we might not mention the, the walnut husks and the, and the nitric acid. Um, this is, I love this, this is a, a Chicano art show in California called Beyond the Label. Um, but labels are very important. How many of you read labels in museums? Yay! <laughs> it's usually about 50%. <laughs> this is a good crowd. Okay. Um, the, the labels that we do at the National Hispanic Cultural Center um, are, we, we take a lot of time doing them. We work very carefully to not use pejorative, anything that could be pejorative in any end always to elevate the artist. There is, there is an art to label writing, and there's even a contest, the American Association of Museums, the curatorial um, uh, group, has a, con a label writing contest. And you'll read, I've, I've judged these labels before, you'll read that there was a team of 19 people that took three years to, I'm making that up, but not that bad, seven people that took a year and a half to write a label. And you can't read this. I have. I was going to do handouts, and then I thought there's a lot of people there. This is one of the the award-winning uh, labels from the curatorial committee last year, and um, it's very. It's really you really can't read it. It's um, very full full of large words, exclusionary words, um, European. It's a very Euro treatment of a classic uh, image. And this is another one that they did on Goya. Those are the award-winning labels. What we try to do, because we're a first voice institution, whenever we can be, is get the artist's voice in the labels. Mm -hmm. And this is, um, speaking of Patrocinio Barella, the first Taos artist of any ethnicity who was protected and not allowed to move up in the art world. We actually did a show of his. We actually have the largest public collection um, of Patrocinio Barella works. We have over 50 and a door. Um, and this is a show that we did of his works, elevating the works to art. We also um, used contemporary artists, or had contemporary artists because he is a rock star, and lots of people in the, in the, in the Hispanic art world here in New Mexico, he's the one who made it because he was at the Museum of Modern Art, right? And we included quotes up on the walls. This is the other. Um, artist who was in the show, Edward Gonzalez, whose work you're probably all very familiar with. And this is another um, show that we recently did um, pa on papel, on the art of Papel Picado, Papel Pico, Rico y Chico. I have four artists. And so in the labels here, we, um, I have the artist write them. Instead of having the curator saying, this is what, you know, this is, you're doing a postmodern impression of a post-colonial, uh, decol decolonized, uh, uh, blue period. <laughs> um, and so the artist wrote the, the, the labels. And we actually didn't limit them to a size, so some of them are smaller and some of them are larger. But for me, I think you have to include this in, in the language of label writing, because um, for me, art comes alive when you know the artist. I mean, how can you not have a connection to the artist and to the work that you're seeing? And I love this Kai, Kai who has also um, worked here. It was uh, two pictures of um, Lucha Libre, two images of Lucha Libre um, uh, fighters, and one was a woman. And she, she felt like she had to 
do El Sanco, the man, in order to contextualize the woman. And so she talks about what that meant for her. Speaking of uh, Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo, and they're, they're dabbling in their art forms, um, Catalina Delgado Trunk uh, talks about, this is sort of a personal <laughs> image of her, like her work. Um, she talks about watching Diego Rivera paint in Mexico City and, and, and um, personalizes it. And then Josie Moore was very brief. <laughs> Breakfast with Snow, Snow White is all about Sleepy. He's my favorite dwarf. <laughs> I love fairy tales, always have. I especially love the Grimm's fairy tales. I liked her tower and the boy that loved her. I have cut two little red riding hoods, and this is the one I like best. It's a dark image. The wolf lurking close by. But the Grimm's fairy tales are dark, aren't they? Sometimes we just write the labels directly on the walls. This is um, uh, Sandra Cisneros' uh, ofrenda to her mother. And um, she just decided she wanted to write it instead of printing out a label. She was going to write it directly on the wall, which, if you know, Sandra Cisneros' work was pretty exciting for us because here's this, you know, <laughs> world famous poet and author, and MacArthur fellow, who's like, oh, I think I, do you have any chalk? <laughs> <laughs> like, sure, we've got chalk. And talk about using language. Each one of her words, she she did not pre-write this, so each one of her, as she as she was writing it. Each one was coming out and she was being very thoughtful. It took almost a day to write that. One of the things about using, one of the important things about using language in the museum, and you know, we are often introducing artists for the first time ever. We are positioning artists because the power of the museum is that when you have, when you show an artist, the museum is validating the artist, right? Most of the gatekeepers who make these decisions, uh, that you know, our decisions aren't always easy to make. Um, do you know that only three percent of all curators in the United States are Latino? Um, so, as gatekeepers, it's a really important place to be. It's a really important power to have. Um, and I'm not saying like, where's my tiara and I've got power and I've got stuff, but it's 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 a really significant thing when you are selecting a piece of art, as the girl and girl said, every aesthetic decision is important. You're selecting a piece of art, you're interpreting that piece of art, you're writing about that piece of art in a label or a catalog or a press release, and then you are exhibiting that, that work. Um, this is an a exhibit that we recently had that of a, the only time we do one person shows is when somebody has, is deceased. Um, we joke around about working with living artists <laughs> and dead artists, but one of the um, the only time we do this is is to recover part of like the scene builder project to recover an artist and insert that artist who may have been forgotten that had left a legacy. And so this is a recent one that we did of of an artist named Marco who sold works at the um, at the flea market in the 70s and the 80s in Albuquerque. And what's so interesting about him is that. So many of the arts, intelligentsia, and Albuquerque collected his works. They were all in graduate school at UNM, and they would go to the flea market, but his, nobody knew of him. Nobody knew of his works. And this is <laughs> this is part of the power of language. This is Marco's family, um, his daughters, and his um, his his entire family. People flew in from Seattle and everything. One of the really neat things about this is that the daughter asked if she could have copies of all. And so she's putting together a book with all the history of, of Marco and all of the um, copies of the labels with the images that we had in the show for all of her family for next year's Christmas. Um, but one of, the re one of the things about working with living communities, working with communities of color, is, especially when you're part of that community, is the language that you use and how you treat it, how you put it on the wall, how you convey to the artists that um, and the families that their work is important, um, and um, how you how you choose to communicate that work and that artistry to either a community that might not understand it or to the community that makes it. It's a very interesting place to make. I wonder what you were doing with this. Thing.
Well, what you're going to do is actually help us write a label. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> this is also Eric Garcia, the, the, the same artist who wrote uh, who did Sleeping Giant. Um, he happens, he's going to be getting married at the center in September. And one of the things that we did is we we're doing a trade with him for art for the space. So this is a piece we actually have hanging. This is his comic, um, Tamale Man. This is the piece that we're getting. <laughs> it's the Tamale Man action figure. <laughs> and this is the Tamale Man action figure in his box. <laughs> so we're going to take a few, we won't write the whole label right now, but we will be putting Tamale Man action figure up on exhibit in the spring. And we'll send out hopefully an email to all of you saying, it's up, come read the label. <laughs> but I thought we could go over just some very quickly some key key things here. And if anybody else after this talk has changed their mind about the words they wrote. <laughs> there. Okay, so let's go for action figure first. I like them. Beast, Hulk, Superman, Captain Picard, Kylo Ren, Mr. T. Do people have these action figures still? <laughs> uh, Ariel, Flash, R2-D2, President Obama, something Superman, as Superman? No, it's a separate. Superman, Superwoman. Squirrel Girl, <laughs> Shrink Wrap, not pretty good, Hard, Tara Thrice, from, uh, Starbuck from Battlestar Galactica, Thor, <laughs> Wonder Woman, Mom to Work, Dad to work, and then a big yes. <laughs> and then for what words to describe a tamale? Yummy, delightful, soulful, traditional, masai, love filled, hot, community, spicy, corny, steamy, sorry, steamy. Har I can't read that. Parthy? Earthy, sorry, earthy. Soft, flavorful, cozy, warm, all, worth all the hard work, family fun, and foot warming. <laughs> <laughs> so, does anybody have any words they want to pull out from that for the label? Does anybody have any words they want to change? Does anybody have any words? Any thoughts about how you would want to describe the tamale man action figure? Oh, don't be shy. <laughs> laser eyes. Looks like he had laser eyes. Laser <laughs> eyes. He looks really tough to me, like with the gritted teeth. Mm -hmm. It just says tough. Like, like for day. Mm -hmm. Like day? Good. We're getting all of this right. <laughs> I'm trying to remember it in my mind. It looks like he's riffing on the pop bobblehead. There's this whole Ooh, culture mm -hmm. of pop bobbleheads over at Astro's Zombies. So I knew this would be a good group to do this with. It's kind of manga-like, you know? Like, mm -hmm. He's cute as well as tough. Yeah. He's cute as well as tough. That's something that Amy said to him. I want to say he's so cute, but I think Colin I wouldn't like that. Cute as well as tough. He might be soft, but he sure is tough. <laughs> Are we writing this down? 